Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And thank you for being here and giving me this opportunity to speak about uh, one of my pet topics, which is uh, the future of education generally, but specifically here in India. Now, this event is being held at a time when some very major uh, sort of shifts are taking place uh, in the space that you are in. It's happening not just within your own uh, space, but more generally, and there are it's technology, uh, or demographics, or our economic requirements, all of these are converging in a way uh, that will uh, create both the space and opportunity um, you know, to do something very radical, and I'm going to talk to you about what the challenge is. But in some ways, radical change is perhaps inevitable anyway. So what, is, what, are, these diver, what are these diverse uh, sort of uh, factors that are beginning to play out? First and foremost, as many of you have read in the newspapers, as of this week, India has now become the world's most populous country. But importantly, uh, this uh, shift has happened um, in a way that is quite different from what happened in China, which was a very sudden um, drop in their birth rates. Ours have been much smoother, which means that our demographic shift, of course, will be somewhat smoother. But that does not mean, however, that it will go on forever. We effectively have a 30-year slot where India will be at its demographic peak. So from about now till somewhere around about 2050 or something there about 20, early 2050s. So not, a, not for eternity. So in this 30 years, a disproportionate proportion of India's population will be a working age. Because our birth rates have fallen, the inflow of uh, sort of children will drop, but we won't be aging on the other end so rapidly. So in fact, what will happen is that our dependency ratios will drop from here on and will remain low for the next three decades. And this is what everybody knows is the sweet spot which other countries, whether it was China in the last 20, 25 years, or the other East Asian countries before that, or Europe even before that, and so on, used to drive rapid growth. So this is the first thing that we are already embarked on, the second stage of demographic transition that we, we have already entered it. The second thing that is happening is, of course, the transition of India into a major player in the global uh, supply chains. This is already true in the field of services. India, for a variety of historical reasons, um, became a services economy before it became an industrial economy. Of course, we continue to have aspirations to sort of fill out retrospectively the industrial stage as well. And as you may be reading in the newspapers, we are now making a big effort and push to insert ourselves into the global goods supply chains as well. But whether it's services or goods, it does mean that India has an extraordinary opportunity here to grow at a heightened rate of economic expansion uh, over a long period of time, the kinds that in the past were seen, as I said, in East Asia and before that in Europe and other, what are now the developed countries of the world. Um, as, uh, <clears throat> and in this, we are seeing large amount of shift of global supply chains already happening just in the last Few, few weeks, you've seen, for example, Apple um, beginning to shift a large part of its production, and of course, its partner Foxconn begin to shift a lot of its production into India. You're seeing that happening with Adidas, it's happening with Puma. A across every kind of product, you're beginning to see companies moved out of China and more generally East Asia and move them to India. So in this, obviously, a big impact important part of this is rapid skilling. So whether it's the demographics or the needs of an economy that is now, by some margin, the fastest growing major economy in the world, we need to educate and skill our workforce as fast as we can. And we can't wait for 
you know, a decade or two to build out old style bricks and mortar universities um, in the way we may have had the luxury of doing in, uh, in the past or for example uh, the West did in the 19th and early 20th century because they went, you know, during their high growth phase uh, it was much, it was much smoother curve in a sense. They had, they had since you know, the industrial revolution happened late 18th century, the UK actually went into its uh, higher growth stage somewhere in the late 18th century, sustained it through much of the 19th and early 20th century. So we will be compressing all of that in the 30 years and we are already in that 30 years. So what can we do about our education system to deal with this? Now there are many ideas there and many of them are there in the new economic policy that came out just a year and a half or two years ago. I'm not going to talk, deal with what needs to be done with you know, uh, primary and higher uh, high school education. This is more or less about tertiary education and let me say there is a huge opportunity here because of yet another shift, a technological shift that has also happened uh, as we, in the last few years, which is the coming together of various digital technologies which allow for giving um, and scaling up uh, tertiary education on a massive scale at a fraction of the cost it would have taken if we had to do it the old bricks and mortar way. Now, at the risk of oversimplifying, let me say, we have a situation where YouTube has made repetitive lectures redundant. You just need to give one lecture anywhere in the world in a subject and that's good enough. All of us can watch it. Chat GPT has made Q&A redundant. All kinds of libraries are now available for research, more or less digitally available. Even even history where some you may need some archives, etc. much of it is now available and of course in the sciences whether it's, you know, uh, various kinds of academic papers and all kinds of other data is now available almost freely worldwide at the click of a button. And of course even classroom experience can increasingly be mimicked at least to some extent through things like Zoom and so on. So given that this is how we have ended up, it seems to me that it is a waste of time for us to try and create tertiary education and upskilling in the traditional way. Now I'm not saying that there isn't other roles that universities may play in terms of socializing and s such like, but my view is look, why do I need to build large expensive campuses for that? Surely what you really need is a bunch of cafes and YMCA or whatever it is that is the equivalent in your country. For an education, I actually need to enable these digital tools, package them in a way and make them essentially free. YouTube is free. Zoom is essentially free. All these archives are free. Chat GPT is free. The age of expensive university education, at least for undergraduate education, I believe is now over. So what is the role that universities will continue to play? Universities will still have something, a role to play, but it will be about other things. One important thing it will, a role that it will have to play will be about testing. About making sure that claims made by students about certain levels of skill are true. So that continues to be a role that universities will play. It's a signaling tool, it's that that's key. And that is something they'll have to, the old idea of that you can give people a project, etc., is now redundant. You, this is where the better the, the better, better the ability of a exam system to be able to, to test the knowledge and problem solving skills of a student, the better that university, uh, the value proposition of that university. Two, the research that these universities do, because now, what is standardized is available freely. So what, what is it that universities bring to the table? Universities bring to the table the cutting edge 
of pools of knowledge which have not yet become digitized and standardized, where they are still fluid areas of knowledge. So I think this is another big area that universities will play a big role. So all of this, by the way, however, means that we need to completely think, rethink the need for these old style legacy university campuses. I am of the belief, by the way, that there are already too many university campuses on this planet. India does not, has not yet built the universities of the future and perhaps we will never need to build them. We will need a few university campuses which may be used for, a, you know, each batch may need to come, come together for a few months of the year. But this idea that, you know, an IIT needs, you know, needs to exclusively be put, put, put aside for one batch for four years is over. Each batch may come in for three months of the year. That means four batches in 12 months can be easily put, pushed through. Many batches may never even have to come through. Uh, you can even get them to meet in other, other locations in other ways. Uh, and of course, this is an opportunity in multiple ways because in a rapidly changing technological world, we need to also get away from another legacy issue, which is this business that you spend essentially the first 25 years of your life getting loading on information and skills and then you work for the next 35 years or so till you retire and then you go off and play golf. That is already over because what this old style education does is by the time the person is actually taking real decisions at, in their 50s, they are the most redundant people in the entire chain. So this old style of giving skills is largely pointless because the least skilled are the most senior in the system. So we need, we will be very soon be having everywhere, I think, and it's, you already see that in happening in corporate, corporate environments, people are beginning to have to go back and take re-education in multiple fields. And by the way, this will happen even for people, um, not just within their skill level, but w where old skills are dying out so fast, old fields are dying out so fast, you may be, have to go back and reskill yourself in a completely different field at the age of 50. But that's okay because most of us in this room are going to live till 80. And we will probably be reasonably fit, fit to the age of 75. So it's perfectly fine to spend the first 25 years of your career as a lawyer and then go back to university and then have another 20 years as a doctor. You know, the average 75 year old today is fit enough to go to office every day. It's not a big deal. So all of these changes are beginning to happen whether we like it or not. But for India, this is a huge, huge, huge opportunity because bringing together all these pieces means that we can leapfrog. We can leapfrog just like the way we leapfrogged fi fixed line telephony and went mobile. We are going to leapfrog old style education and go digital to the extent we can because we need to do it quickly and because there simply isn't any time or any point in recreating old university education. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.